myself, my name is Casey, and together with my wife Amy, we are the lead pastors of the refinery. And, and all that means is we have an assignment and a responsibility to listen for God's direction for us as a community and do our best to navigate us towards that direction, okay? Uh, our, our goal and our mission is to help you experience God every day, okay? It's not about church. It's not about anything other than experiencing the presence of God, okay? He is our hope. He is our love. Uh, he is our goal, and he is enough, all right? If you're new with us, if this is your first uh, ever Sunday with us, um, we usually do better than this, okay? <laughs> um, I, I've, I actually have never worked at a church that has had better production than we have here. I, I'll say that. Um, but more than that, we're glad that you're here. And we hope that you come back next week. As Ben mentioned earlier, Amy and I would love to meet you in person. So there's a White Connect tent. Before you leave, make sure you grab some food and then head over to the White Connect tent. Amy and I would love to meet you personally. Okay, um, today we're beginning a brand new series called Brand New. Somebody say brand new. Brand new. Brand new. And, um, and here's, here's what's true. We all love brand new things, right? Like a brand new house. That's pretty sweet brand new car. There's nothing like a new car smell, right? I sold my car uh, just this past week. It was 14, 15 years old. I've had it for 12 years. I had my son detail it and he did a great job. Solo and Sparrow did an amazing job. I paid him $55. Solo made 50, Sparrow made five. <laughs> And we got, we got air freshener, we got an air freshener for the car, and guess what smell it was? New car, New car smell, right? Um, the best it's ever smelt since I owned it. <laughs> we love new babies. I love, ba I love new babies. Over the last, like, like, there's a baby right there, and that baby is amazing, right? And we love babies. Don't, hey, don't feel like you need to take her out. Nobody here is going to get distracted. We love kids. They are a blessing. Amen? Amen. Amen and amen. Right? New things. Right? Apple. I, I, in fact, to today, I feel like an Apple employee. Right? I got like tech vibes going on. Um, Apple spends a lot of money so that your experience opening up a brand new Apple product is amazing. Right? It's amazing. We all love new stuff. A new season, a new day, uh, a new start. Um, and a new year is actually an opportunity for you and I to hit that refresh button, right? It's an opportunity to reflect on the year that was and make maybe some changes in our present so that our future is more desirable or more exciting or you and I are more like Jesus at the end of, at the end of this next year. And that's what this series is all about. Now, let me be clear. This series, brand new, is not about New Year's resolutions, right? Now, think about your life for a moment. You, you, might, you might think, man, okay, in a year from now, I want to be more physically fit. Okay, that's great. That's a great goal. You might think, I want to be more financially fit. That's a great goal, too. You might think, man, I want to experience more joy and more peace in my life and less anxiety in my life. That's a great goal, right? You might want to have double the TikTok followers. I have no idea. That's a weird goal, but I guess some, some of you are making money on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. It's amazing. Good job. That might be your goal. That's okay. This series is not about behavior modification as much as it's about internal transformation that makes its way out to the external and experiential parts of our life, okay? And so certainly, as we walk through the series, I want you to have some of those areas in your life where you're like, man, I want to grow. I want to be made new. I need to hit the restart button in this area of my life. For some of you, maybe it's your whole life. Maybe... Maybe circumstantially you've hit, hit a place that you would, you would say, man, I'm, I'm at rock bottom right now. And you're like, my whole life needs to be made brand new. 
Well, I got great news for you. This morning, we're going to look at a passage of the Bible, and it's between a woman at a well and Jesus. And the woman at the well, the best description of her life is rock bottom. She's a mess. She's a mess. And as far as I can tell, Jesus intentionally went to her. Someone who was overlooked, someone who had been beaten up, someone who was a social outcast, somebody's who, somebody whose life was a total mess. And Jesus made time for her. So no matter how messy your life is or how stuck you feel, guess what? There's hope. There's hope for you today. There's hope for you tomorrow. And there's hope for your future. Okay? This morning, we're going to talk about heart change. A heart change. A heart change. If we're going to experience real transformation that affects our physical life, that affects our financial, our relational, our emotional, our spiritual life, guess what? We've got to start with a brand new heart. The series is not just for those who are asking questions about Jesus and exploring the teachings of Jesus. This series is also for those of us who've been following Jesus for a short time or a long time. We've all got areas in our heart that still have darkness, don't we? I mean, it comes out in my life. It comes out in your life too. And so which are those areas of your heart that you need Jesus to come into, clean it up a little bit, and, and, and give you a brand new life in that area, okay? This morning is about experiencing a brand new heart, okay? So uh, we, we start with the story in John chapter four. Again, it's about a woman at a well and Jesus. It's one of my favorite stories of all time. And I'm, I'm not gonna teach like word for word. In fact, I've done this one story uh, in a series of five teachings, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the whole story in um, less than 20 minutes, okay? Less than 20, well, 25 minutes. Here we go. Uh, her story begins in, in chapter 4, uh, verse 3. And here's what it says. It says this. So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Okay, so Jesus is um, in, the, in the southern part of Israel in Judea. And he wants to go to the northern region of Israel called Galilee. This is where Nazareth is. Okay, that's where his, his home is. And it says this in verse 4. It says, he had to go through Samaria. Somebody say, he had to. Yeah. He had to. He had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town uh, in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Now, here's what's interesting. Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully human. And I love this little detail. Jesus was tired. And you know what? He's thirsty. And you know what? It's lunchtime and his disciples are in town getting tacos from the local taco truck. <laughs> Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully human. Jacob's well was there and Jesus was tired as he was from the journey. He sat down at or by the well. It was noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Verse nine, the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? See, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Okay, there is so much in this passage that I'm not going to tell you because I don't have time. But there's a couple of things I want to point out. We're just scratching the surface. Number one, Jesus did not have to go through Samaria, practically speaking. See, there was two ways to get from Jerusalem or Judea up to the northern um, region of Israel in Galilee. Good, committed Jews would go around Samaria. It would take an extra day or two. But there was so much animosity between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. And part of it has to do with intermarrying and their commitment to God. The Jews saw themselves as superior to the Samaritans. 
But the text says that Jesus, what? Had to go through Samaria, which suggests that he had an appointment to make. He had a divine appointment to keep. He had to show up on time for a person. And that person was the woman at the well. Secondly, the well in, in this era is both a practical and a social destination for women. See, women would get up really early in the morning and they would, they would take their bucket or their jar and they would, they would hike to the nearest well to get the water that they would need for cooking and cleaning and bathing and drinking, of course. But they didn't just get the day's water. They went to hang out with their girlfriends, right? Think grocery store, think coffee shop. I, will, I went into um, um, the Crafted Scone one time at about 9.30 in the morning. And I walked up into the line. I'm like the fourth or fifth person in line. And it was jam-packed. I was the only man in the coffee shop, right? I literally, I'm like, there is, there's probably 35 women in here and me. In fact, I, I, it was so packed, I had to ask somebody at a four-person table with three people sitting there if I could have that fourth seat. And they, they, they were gracious, and they let me, and I stayed. I stayed, uh, maybe uh, against my better judgment, right? It was both practical and social. So why was she here at noon? Well, it suggests that she was trying to avoid something. She was a social outcast. She, she avoided rush hour because, because there were some things in her life that maybe other people knew about and would talk about and judge her for and condemn her for. So she was a woman in pain. We're going to find out what some of that stuff was. But instead of going in the cool of the day, she went at the heat of the day because she was trying to avoid some pain. She was trying to avoid some pain. Verse 10. Here's what it says. Jesus answered her. Remember, Jesus asked for some water. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw, draw with, and the well here is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than the father, their father, the father, sorry, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Guess what? You get physically fit without heart change, you're going to be thirsty again. You get a new car without heart change, you're going to be thirsty again. You get a new boyfriend, you get a new girlfriend, you get a new wife, you get a new husband, you're going to be thirsty again. You need a heart change. You and I need a heart change. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here. So Jesus asks for a drink of water, and she all but rejects him, right? And what we're going to watch over the course of this story is this woman's heart begin to change. And the first change that happens is she makes a shift from a closed heart to an open heart. And if you and I are going to, going to experience heart change in our life, there are three shifts that need to happen. Our heart, number one, needs to shift from a closed heart to an open heart. See, she was closed off. She responded with coldness. Right? She was not open to a conversation with Jesus. She was not open to what God might have in store for her. She's hardened by the pain in her life, right? She's hardened by the pain in her life. I'll, I'll remember um, several years ago, I was at a great church, but there were some broken people who were working there, including myself. 
And my time at that church ended very painfully. Many of you have experienced church hurt. And it's real. But guess what? It's not because the, the church sucks. It's because people suck, right? And churches are full of what? People. Yeah. I always say this, man. If you're looking for the perfect church, don't go there because you'll mess it up. Okay? And the refinery is no different. We are not a perfect church and never will be. Okay? And what happened when I experienced the pain there is that I closed off parts of my heart. And it was actually very difficult to open back up. I found it difficult to spend time with God. Why? Because I had experienced pain and I closed off a part of my heart and I stopped being vulnerable as I should be in my relationship with God. Over time, I began to forgive the people who had hurt me. And then guess what? I forgave them again and again and again and again. And it was a process. And as I began to forgive and walk through the journey of forgiveness, guess what I realized? I realized I was a part of the problem. And I had to walk through that. And as I walked through that journey, my heart began to shift from closed off to opened back up, right? Opened back up to experiencing God. Opened back up to God's will for my life, right? Some of you came in here and, and you're like, I'm gonna put God to the test, right? What if you said, hey, I'm curious if God is real? It's a different vibe, isn't it? Some of you, you've closed off portions of your heart and it's making relationships hard. It's making your marriage hard. It's making parenting hard. It's making real life change and transformation difficult. It's making it difficult for you to connect with God. This morning, I want to invite you to make this first shift, right? Make the shift from a closed heart to an open heart, okay? That's the first shift. That's the first shift. Be beginning in verse 16, it says this. He told her, go and get your husband. Okay, we're going to skip back. We're going to go back to 15. It says this. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. So she wants this water. What is he talking about? So that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here and being reminded of my messy life. Verse 16. He told her, go and call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you're right. When you say you have no husband, verse 18, the fact is that you have had five husbands and the man that you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. I can see that you're a prophet. Okay, so here's what's true. In a moment, we're going to see that this woman has a spiritual life. She's going to initiate a conversation with Jesus about where she should go to church and where she should worship God. And so here's what we know. This woman, part of the reason why she's going to the well at noon is because she has a wake of relationships behind her. The woman's been divorced five times. And she's now with the new guy, right? This doesn't hap happen because she's full of joy. This happens because she's full of pain. And she's trying to fill the hole in her heart with something other than God, okay? This woman has a spiritual life. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a picture with my left hand, and I'm not even an artist with my right hand, okay? So this is a judgment-free zone, correct? Yeah. All right. Here's what I'm going to illustrate. This woman, the second shift is this. This woman, Jesus is inviting her to move from a prioritized heart to a centralized heart. Here's what I mean by that. God is, as we're going to see in a moment, God is a priority in her life, but God is not central to her life. Okay, here's what I mean by this, okay? So for most of us, we have a life, right? How many of you don't have a life? Raise your hand. 
Okay, nice, I like that. You don't have a life? Okay, well, let's talk later, okay? So what we do, right, this is our life. What we do is like we have all these like sections and you know, it's like, oh yeah, these are my priorities in my life and uh, that sort of thing, okay? So we could say like, this is my family. Oh my gosh, guys, this is so bad. That says fam, okay? So like, oh man, they're a really big priority. Then I have like work, work's a pretty big priority here. Oh boy, I've been journaling with my left hand for the last six or seven weeks and I've gotten better with my left hand, so, okay? So these are really big priorities, like, oh yeah, um, what else a priority, oh, okay, um, finances are a pretty big priority, so we gotta, we gotta take care of our finances, make sure we pay our credit cards on time and make sure, we, make sure we have enough set aside for groceries, like that's a big deal. Okay, but also, what else? Um, uh, God is a pretty big priority in my life. So, you know, um, I go to church once every three weeks. Okay, so he's a pretty big priority in my life. And I don't know, name one more, my hobby. You know, so what is it? Hiking. Hiking is your new hobby. And it's a pretty, pretty big priority. Okay, so that, can I have a round of applause for my left-handed right? That's actually, one second. It's pretty darn good. It's pretty darn good. Okay. And so God is a priority in our life. Okay? How many of you are like, that's good? No, nobody knows that because it's a trick question. Okay? So here's, here's the way it should, here's the way God is inviting us to create our life. Okay? Or shape our life. Okay? So we still have our priorities. I'm going to go faster here. We still have our priorities, but God is not a priority. God needs to be the center. Yeah. Because here's what happens if God is just a priority. We give God some of our time. We give God some of our money. We give, some, we give God some of our affection. We give God some of our attention. But then my work life, that's mine. My dating life, that's mine. But what happens is if God is not a priority, but he is central, then he touches all the other areas in our life. We begin to ask the question, okay, since God is central, how should I begin to look at my finances? Okay, since God is central, how do I make decisions? Okay, since God is central, how do I treat my neighbors? Do you see that? God isn't just a slice of the pie. He touches all the slices of the pie. And what God is inviting us into this morning is to move from God, you're a priority, to God, you're the center. God, you're the center. That's good. We've got to shift from a prioritized heart to a centralized heart. Okay, one more round of applause for my left hand. Uh, right I'm going to toss this to you. Thank you. All right. Where are we at? Verse 20? Is that where we're at? Verse 20? Verse 19. We're going we're gonna to start in verse 19. All right. Here's what it says. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. Okay? So, so you can see that, that God was a priority. She knows her spiritual history. She has a she has a, some sort of relationship with God. She's thinking about worship. She's going to church every once in a while. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Okay? So God wants us to worship with our affection and our attention. God wants us to worship, see worship as, as, as something we do with our whole life. Worship is not something that we do when there's a band in front of us. Uh, I mean, it is, but it's not, that, it's not where it ends. Yeah. Worship is not just singing songs. It's the way that we live our whole life. 
And someone who prioritizes God can't see what it means or what it looks like to worship God with your whole life. But someone with a centralized heart has no problem seeing our whole life as an act of worship. Verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, hey, I know that the, the Messiah is coming called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one you're speaking to, am he. Woo! Surprise! This woman is stuck thinking religion. She's stuck with a religious heart. She's not free. She's a prisoner. Amen. See, religion is about doing, being at the right place, at the right time, doing the right stuff. Let me add, the right way. Jesus is inviting her into what we now call Christianity, which is about being with the right person. That's good. Yeah. Jesus. If we, want, if we want a brand new heart, we've got to make the shift from a religious heart to a relational heart. Look, there are so many practices and rhythms attached to following Jesus. Can I just tell you, it's not about being at the right place at the right time, doing the right things the right way. Those rhythms, being here, reading the scriptures, the Bible, Prayer, fasting, giving, all, all worship. It's a, the, the intention there is to remind you of the presence of God in your life. They're, they're relational tools that help you connect with the creator God of the universe. If we, if we want to experience heart change, we've got to shift from a religious heart to a relational heart. Why don't you guys come on up? You ready? I know, it's kind of abrupt. I want to show you one of my favorite passages, um, Revelation. We got that? I'll finish here in a minute. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus' best friend, John, very late in his life, writes this letter, John, the Apostle John. So we just read from John chapter 4, the guy that wrote that, you know, recorded that book. He writes this. It's verse 17. He writes this to a church. So, and, and as, you'll, as you'll soon find out, this church was imperfect. Okay? Just, just like ours. Verse 17. This is Jesus speaking through the, through the Apostle John to a church. He says, You say that I'm rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Okay? Not like encouraging. Okay? Spiritually speaking, they're poor, broken, and naked. These people have everything, but they feel empty. Ever been there before? They got the new stuff, but then the adrenaline rush is gone. The dopamine hit has passed. Verse 18, I counsel you, I encourage you, I beg you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. There's more to life than what we own. Do you know this? There's more to life than what we can collect. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Be earnest and repent. Repent means to turn around, right? It means to change your mind. It means to hit the restart button. It means you can be brand new. I love this part though. Verse 20, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I'm going to read that, that, that verse again. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That is Christianity. That is following Jesus. Jesus inviting you into a relationship where everything in your life can be an opportunity to connect with the Father. You and I need a heart change. We need to shift from a closed heart to an open heart. We need to make the shift from a prioritized heart where God is in the middle. And we, we need to make a shift from a religious heart to a relational heart. In just a moment, these guys are going to play a brand new song. Not just to us, but to the world. Brianna and Victor have been working uh, together with some other folks. And they wrote this beautiful song. And they, they, they texted it to me the other day on Thursday. And it was released on Friday. And I'm in Phoenix and I, I put it on. And I'm just listening to these words and allowing these words just to, just to rush over me. To allow them to sing the words above me and to let those words just fall down on top of me. And as the song played, I was impressed with the song. But I started bawling my eyes out. I had an encounter with God I haven't had in a long time. I had to pull over into an apartment complex in Phoenix. I'm, I'm sitting there at a light and I'm like, I got my sunglasses on, of course, because I'm in Phoenix. And I'm like, <laughs> and then I'm like hiding my face. Oh, they're going to think I just got broke up with, you know? <laughs> and I pulled over and I, I FaceTimed Brianna and Victor and my wife. And I just called them to say, dude, that song was awesome. But then even as I was getting that, those words out of my mouth, I literally got wrecked again. The Spirit of God just washed over me. And I'll tell you what, I, it, was like, it was like I was hitting the restart button in my relationship with God in a new way. This woman is overlooked. She's a social outcast. She's a an orphan, if you will. And if we're going to move from a closed heart to an open heart, a prioritized heart to a centralized heart, and a religious heart to a relational heart, we've got to encounter God as a God who loves you, as a God who has mercy, as a God who wants to be with you, as a God who says, come on in, sit at the table, and let's eat together, okay? I want to encourage you, let these first few lyrics wash over you, and then when you get the hang of it, stand up and sing it out to God, all right? Thanks.